selling insurance was something that came very natural to me. I enjoyed it. I loved it. I made a lot of money. I was making $500 a week when the average income was 150 I was a member of the Million Dollar Round Table when I was with the Prudential. And eventually I grew over to have my own agency. I started my own agency, the Ori Agency, with Credit Life A and H, uh, to autom on the sales of financing finance car to automobile dealers. When you bought a car and you financed it, it was the credit life and accident and health. If you died, the car got paid off. If you became disabled, we made your car payments for you. We would try to talk you out of paying cash for your car. and finance it, why it'd be better to you. And then I became a distributor for Polyglycol. We did warranties and I had a whole gamut of products. I had over 250 auto dealers as clients <coughs> in the state of New York. Polyglycol was devised by a gentleman by the name of Walter Fison. No need to shine your car again. No need to wax your car. Guaranteed for three years. And I contacted Walter Fison. And he lived in Scarsdale, New York. So we had an appointment. And I'll never forget, his wife Gloria's on the phone. And he introduced me to Gloria after the maid cooked his breakfast. And then Walter's in another corner on the phone like he's talking to somebody. And when he gets off the phone, he says, hey, kid, for some reason, Walter always called me kid. So you know who that was? And he named this distributor in New Jersey who was into electronics. They were big. He said, they're going to become a distributor too. And to become a distributor, the requirement was you had to buy 100 cases. I remember it was $15,000. And I told Walter, I says, uh, let me think about it. And he and Goya drove me. Uh, I had always maintained a suite at the Warwick Hotel on 54th and 6th in the city. And I got there. I called Walter. I said, I'm going to have my turn in here next week. Come in with the contracts. I'm going to be a distributor. I said, I'm going to tell you why I decided. He says, why? I said, because anybody's got the balls to try to con me the way you did is going to go someplace. Because that guy that you told me you talked to in New Jersey, you didn't talk to him. He didn't know who the hell you were because I called the guy. He didn't know who Walter was. I said, that was good, I says. I gotta respect that. And the company grew like crazy. I mean, every Toyota come in uh, the port. I mean, we eventually got them. Every Toyota had every polyglycol product on it. Frank Russo was always my lawyer. Uh, I rented the upstairs from, the, his office was downstairs, he owned the building. I rented from upstairs, he and I became very close friends. Frank's father was the boss in upstate New York, Rome, New York. Through his father's contact, Frank ended up meeting everybody throughout the country. And it's not that I d ever did anything with Frank Costello. I met him twice with Frank Russo. Uh, he told me to call him Uncle Frank, <coughs> which I did. And he's a guy that told me, always be a gentleman. Because he saw me looking at girls all the time. <laughs> you know, being in New York, being at the Waldorf Astoria. Uh, and then I met Russell Buffalino. We had lunch with him at a place called De Marcos. Uh, one of the 40ths it was in New York City. And then we got to know Russell. Uh, when they arrested him, they had him in, uh, uh, they were transferred to New York City, I believe. And uh, they had him for a couple of nights in, uh, in the sheriff's uh, jail in Oriskany, New York. 
Well, in those days, we had, Frank was very big politically, uh, had things locked down, so we used to bring Russell his dinner every night, bring him spaghetti and meatballs, sausage, raviolis, <laughs> And, and we bring it right into the prison. And for those who don't know, he was the boss of the Pennsylvania family. Yes. Top guy. He was quiet. He was a gentleman. Uh, they called him the Quiet Don. And uh, that's who Joe Pesci just played in The Irishman. That was the Frank Sharon story. Yes. One of the few non-Italians that was very connected to a family. Correct. Uh, I believe Frank Sharon supposedly was half Italian. Uh, but Frank Sharon's not the guy who killed Jimmy Hoffa. Oh, you don't believe that to be the case? No, not at all. No, that 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 was done by uh, uh, Provenzano. Uh, he had that arranged. He took care of it. Pretty confident. Jimmy Hoffa built the Teamsters Union. So he felt he owned it. And after his time in jail, that guy could have retired, done anything he wanted to do. Uh, there was no lack of money there or anything of that nature. And he was friendly with everybody. But, you know, Jimmy was a little tight with a dollar. And he had no idea what that Teamster pension fund did. I mean, it built Las Vegas. Uh, I mean, I remember the guy in upstate New York... Uh, Rocco DiPerno, <coughs> he was a guy who loaned money upstate uh, in New York for for the Teamsters. Hoffa was tight with it, and that was his problem. And eventually he had to go. He was just creating too many problems for everybody. Yeah. But i tell you what I did like because nobody came up with that idea. I don't know if Martin Scorsese came up with it or if it was in the book. I didn't read the book because everybody wonders. Jimmy Hoffa has never been found. No, I heard that he went through a hamburger grinder, but that part about having him cremated at the end was a good. I never heard that part before. I want to talk about how you start to meet some of these Hollywood figures. I think the first ones you meet are. Uh, Ralph Serpy and Dino De Laurentiis. Correct. Uh, talk about how you met them <coughs> and what kind of work you started doing once you started meeting Hollywood folks. Well, I had the Ori agency. I had my de things in the automobile business. And uh, we were invited. Uh, they were filming The Bricks Job in Boston. And the only guy from The Bricks Job that was there was Maz Jaffe. And you got to remember something. Those guys never admitted to doing it. Even though they went to jail for it, they still never admitted doing it. And I met John Cassavetes. I met Peter Falk. I met all the actors that were in that film. And I remember one night we all went to dinner. And I, I, I think everybody in Boston was on the payroll of that movie. The movie didn't make money. <laughs> <coughs> but we were at Jimmy's Harborside in Boston. Me, Frank Russo, uh, Ralph Serpy, Maz Jaffe, uh, the chief of police of Boston, a few other people. And me and Ralph started asking Maz Jaffe question after question. And then finally we went, why'd you do it? And he went, and they stopped. Almost, we almost had it out from him, but he stopped. But we had him going question after question we were asking him, Ralph and I were doing. I became close with Ralph, and uh, then through Ralph, of course, uh, I came up with the idea how to bring my business national. If it wasn't for an informant named Jimmy Generelli who worked for me and made a ton of money with me, I'd probably be a billionaire today. Yeah, no question about it.
Thanks for watching StreetTV.net. If you're not subscribed, please hit that button below and click the bell to receive alerts and notifications. Like and comment below to give us your feedback and be sure to watch the two related videos to the right. If you want to support this platform or follow us on social media, visit the links in the description and listen to our weekly podcast, The Gangster Chronicles, every Thursday. And thanks for watching StreetTV.net.